The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. And starring Lawson Zerbe in The Most Famous Man in the World. This is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you'll enjoy the trip. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as we meet two people who haven't even been born yet. It's a story I call The Most Famous Man in the World. famous man in the world? You don't know him yet, but you will, if things happen as predicted. His name is Frank Richards, and he has a very odd story. You may find it a little hard to believe at first, but so many things are hard to believe these days, aren't they? So please, keep an open mind while Frank gives you all the facts. And here he is. I wouldn't be telling you this if Mabel hadn't asked me to. Just before she went to the hospital, she said, Frank, you tell people exactly what's happened. Even if they don't believe you, you'll have done your duty. And I said, all right, I would. So I'm going to tell you about the Deans. They rented our front room, John and Susie Dean. They spell their names funny. John, J-O-N, and Susie, S-U-S-I. You see, we had an extra room in our apartment, and when we learned there was going to be an addition to the family, we decided we needed some extra money. So I went down to the paper and put in an advertisement, offering our front room for rent. Then I went to work. When I got home about six, and I'd hardly settled down with my paper when the door buzzer rang. Frank, see who that is, will you, dear? I'm busy with supper. All right, sweetheart. Yes? Mr. Frank Richards? Yes, that's my name. I'm John Dean. And this is my wife, Susie. Oh, pleased to meet you. How do you do, Mr. Richards? We have come desirous of renting the room which you posted in today's newsprint. You mean the room I advertised in the paper? Of course, the room you advertised in the paper. It has not been allotted yet, has it? Well, you mean rent it? Yes. Well, no. As a matter of fact, the uh, paper the ad is in isn't even out yet. You mean not printed yet? That's right. It's the morning paper. Doesn't come out until about uh, 9 p.m. And it's only 6.15 now. Oh, but you are wrong. It is out. We have a copy of it. Here, Mr. Richard, you see? The City Gazette for Wednesday, June 6, 1951, old style. 1951, old style? I mean, Anno Domini. And here is your posting. I mean, your advertisement. Charming front room for rent. Newly furnished kitchen privileges. May I look at that paper? Of course. My ad, that's right. But this is the final edition of the paper. It shouldn't be out now. It's not supposed to be printed until about 4 o'clock tomorrow morning. John, we have made a mistake. Well, what is it, Has Frank? someone come to see our front room, sweetheart? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dean, uh, my wife. How, how, do, how do you do? do? How do you do? <laughs> well, Frank, you mustn't keep him standing in that dark hallway. Won't you come in, see the room? Thank you. We will. It is very kind of you. <clears throat> room is right this way, and... Oh. Yes? Oh, nothing. If you'll come this way? Of course. Come on, John, dear. Well, I knew what it was that had startled Mabel. The way the deans were dressed. I hadn't been able to see clearly in the dark hall, but once they were inside, I saw that Mrs. Dean was wearing a tight little hat and a fur neck piece and a short-skirted dress, vintage of 1929. While Mr. Dean had on an old-fashioned frock coat, a boiled shirt, and a stand-up collar, high-buttoned shoes, striped formal trousers, and was carrying a, a silk top hat. A minute later, Mabel came out, leaving them to look the front room over, and joined me, looking puzzled. Frank, did you see how they're dressed? Well, they might have gotten those clothes out of a museum. Well, maybe they're going to a masquerade ball, but that, that's not the funniest thing about them. Mm -hmm. Mabel, that newspaper they had just can't be printed yet. It's about ten hours ahead of time. I think... Shh, shh. Here they come. 
My wife and I have been talking about the room. And we want to take it. Why, that's fine. It is a lovely room. Has such a nice, clear view of the street. And we would like to stay here because we have read so much about you both. We feel that we know you. Read so much about us? Why, yes, you are famous. Goodness, I cannot imagine how many words... Susie. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I mean, we have heard so much about you from people who know you. Well, anyway, we do like the room and want to rent it. Well, I don't know. We, uh, we were thinking of just one person. Here. We will not be any trouble at all. In your posting, I mean your advertisement, you mentioned $10 a week. We will pay 12 and in advance. Here you are. One month's rent in advance. Well, I, I still think... Oh, I'm sure the deans are perfectly all right, Frank. Go ahead, take the money. Well, if the wife says okay, Mr. Dean. <laughs> then uh, here you are. Yeah, thanks. Say, something the money? You're looking at it as if it were not good. Well, no, I guess it's good all right. It's just that these are the old style bills. The big kind haven't been in use for 20 years or more. That victor at the museum. I beg pardon? Uh, nothing. I can explain the bills. You see, my wife and I have been living abroad. Recently, we received a legacy from a distant relative. She was uh, uh, an eccentric. Left us trunks of old clothes. I've noticed you staring at our clothes. And old money, too. Oh, well, that explains it. Well, in that case, folks, just make yourselves at home. If you got any luggage, why... We are having a couple of bags sent on later. But for now, we are going to buy all new things. <laughs> and about how long do you think you'll be staying, Mrs. Dean? We can tell you exactly, Mrs. Richards. Until five minutes past three in the afternoon, October 30th. <laughs> You see what I mean about the deans being odd? Well, I've explained to you in all this detail so you'll know just how the whole thing started. Well, the next day, the deans went shopping and came back with a brand new up-to-date wardrobe. And a couple of days later, two small trunks of some funny new plastic arrived, but I never saw them open the trunk. They read a lot, mostly newspapers and history books, and stayed in their room a good deal. But they were awfully nice people, very bright and gay. Well, we took to playing bridge evenings and, and talking. Well, that's game and rubber. Do you want to play any more, Susie? No, thank you, Mabel. Let us just sit and listen to the radio and talk. Oh. It is so nice to be able to talk without worrying about a monitor listening in. A monitor? Uh, Susie means uh, a spy. You see, abroad, well... You have to watch everything you say these days. Oh, that must be terrible. It is, Mabel. That is why it is so nice to talk and not worry about saying the wrong thing. But uh, surely in your own home you can talk. No monitors can overhear you then. Oh, but they can. There is two-way television in every home. They can see you and hear you. Everything you say and everything you do. Why, how awful. But where is this? I haven't heard of any place where such a thing has been developed. You two talk just like you'd stepped out of one of these imaginative books about the future. What? What did you say? I said you talk like a couple of people out of a book about the future. Yes, Frank. I suppose we do. But, John... We might as well let Frank and Mabel in on our little secret, darling. They are just about to guess it anyway. You see, folks, we are from the future. You're what? We come from the future, Mabel. I was born in the year 2205. John was born in 2198. Oh, no. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, a gag's a gag, but you're kidding. No, Frank. You are kidding, aren't you? You know we are not kidding. Back home now, the year is 2228. <laughs> So there you have it. Two people from the year 2,228 had rented our front room. People who wouldn't even be born for over 200 years. Two people from the future. Well, 
myself, Frank, Mabel? I see you are convinced now. Oh, yes, I, I guess we are. It's the only answer that uh, explains everything. Especially that newspaper you had when you first came here. It printed ten hours ahead of time. It came from the files of the Historical Museum, Frank. So did our clothes and our money. Our researchers were a few years out of date. You see, we do not know too much about the everyday details of the past. Back in 2228. But, goodness, I should think you could find out every detail about us in your library. Surely the old books and newspapers... Unfortunately... We don't have many old books and newspapers. Why the devil not? For one thing, the war. The the war? Oh, you need not look scared. It will not happen in your lifetime. Not the one I am speaking about. But when it does come, well, there will not be many books or newspapers left. That sounds as if there won't be many people left either. Now we must not talk about the war. In fact, it may never happen, if we are successful. If you're successful? Oh, look, look, you've told us this much. Now I think you've got to tell us a little more. How did you get here from 2228? We came through a time gap, a distortion in the time field. I cannot explain it. It was developed at the Science Institute, and except for a few trial trips, we are the first people ever to use it. All right. Well, that brings up my other question. Why? Well, why did you come? And especially here. Why were you so anxious to rent our front room that you showed up even before my advertisement was printed? Frank, we are photographers. And we have come here into the past to make a newsreel of a political parade. A parade? Yes, it will take place on October 30th. It will be in honor of a candidate for the Senate, a certain Farrington Farnsworth. Farnsworth? Oh, yes, we've heard some of his speeches on the radio, Frank. Oh, sure, I remember. He's a real red-hot, down-with-everybody-but-us kind of politician. In 1964, he was elected president. I mean, he will be elected president. Him? President? Yes, Frank. And in 1972, this country became... I mean, will become a dictatorship. Goodness, it is hard to remember the difference between past and future when you are traveling in time. A dictatorship? This country? Oh, you're joking. No. We are very much in earnest, Mabel. Farrington Farnsworth will become our first dictator. His son will become Farrington Farnsworth the second dictator of the Western Hemisphere. At this moment... Back in 2,228, Farrington Farnsworth, the eighth, is dictator of the world. I guess we sat up most of that night talking. And what John and Susie told us kind of made our hair stand on end about the dictatorship of America and the wars that followed, ending up with a big slam-bang all-out war of 2012 with only 400 million people left alive. And how the dictatorship spread over the world so that by 2,228, the world was ruled by a small group living in luxury, most of them distant descendants of dictator Farnsworth the first. Well, there was more. I guess that's enough to give you the rough idea. The glorious future, not the way John and Susie Dean told it to us. It made me and Mabel mighty glad we were alive now and not then. So John explained they had come back to the past to get a special newsreel of Dictator Farnsworth in his first big public appearance. Now, that's all they would say, so we let it go at that. We didn't tell anybody about them. Who would have believed us? Now that we knew the truth, we weren't puzzled by John and Susie anymore. Well, the weeks went by, and they saw as much of life today as they could. Went to ball games, the theater, all the different restaurants, and uh, had a wonderful time. Sometimes they just sat home with us, and we listened to the radio. Oh, this is so much fun. So much fun. 
I wish it did not have to come to an end. Yes, we have stayed about as long as we can. Tomorrow is the big parade, you know. Oh, yes, the parade for Farrington Farnsworth. We will do our job, and then we will go back into our time. And uh, we'll just go on with the old routine, I suppose, as if we'd never seen you. Well, not exactly the old routine, Frank. No, life will be considerably different for you in the days to come, Frank. You and Mabel. You said something like that the very first day you were here. You said you'd read a lot about us. But where? In the newspapers, Mabel. While John and I were studying up on this time period. In the newspapers? Me and Mabel? To put it bluntly, old man, you are both going to be famous. Oh, you're joking. Why should we be famous? Oh, you don't mean the book I'm writing to, to make a little extra money so that when the baby gets here... No, uh, not uh, your book. Though it will be published. Well, at least that's nice to know. Well, uh, go on, John. Tell us some more about what lies ahead of us. Look, look, I need to make some more money. <laughs> Can't you give me a tip on the stock market? After all, you did read the newspapers. Back there in the future, you said you read all the newspapers for a hundred years. So you must know whether stocks are going up or down. Well, yes, we do. But we cannot tell you. Really, we cannot. And besides, you will not need any such information. But why not? Because you are going to be famous, both of you. For a little while, Frank is going to be the most famous man in the world. It is true, Frank. Really, it is. Oh, I do wish you wouldn't be so mysterious. Can't you give us even a little hint as to why he'll be famous? I could give you half a dozen reasons, but I will not. But when it happens, and you remember that we predicted it, then you will know that all this really took place, even though later it will seem... Just like a strange dream. Well, then I suppose we'll, we'll just have to wait and see, huh? I am afraid so, Frank. And now I think we should all go to bed. Tomorrow is going to be a big day for all of us. So, we all went to bed. Mabel and I tried to figure out what John and Susie meant. How could two average people like us become famous? Didn't Ada? Uh, so, we finally decided they were just kidding us and went to sleep. Well, the next day, we didn't get to talk much. John and Susie were busy. Long before the parade came past, they, they got a funny-looking camera out of their suitcases and started setting it up in the front room, looking out on Main Street. Well, when they finished... We could hear the bands playing in the distance as the parade in honor of Farrington Farnsworth came down our street. Well, here he comes, Susie. Your great, great, many times great-grandfather will be coming past any minute. Yes, I know. I suppose I will be the first person in history to see his great-grandfather eight times removed. Nervous? I am a little what will happen? I do not know. But we will have to be prepared. I am. I am prepared. Hey, what are you two talking about? Is a parade in sight, huh? It is just down the street. Where is Mabel? Oh, she's lying down. Doesn't feel like watching. I'll turn on the radio. We'll get a commentary from the car right behind Farnsworth. I think I can see his car now. Yes, I am sure of it. Well, folks, here we are, halfway to City Auditorium. And so far, at least a half million people have greeted Mr. Barrington Farnsworth from the crowded sidewalk. This is really a triumphal day for him. All public opinion polls predict he'll be swept into the Senate by a landslide. And he was, too. Went on to become dictator. Now his descendants keep the world in slavery. Far ahead as the eye can see, dense mobs line the street. Victory is in the air, victory for Farnsworth and his foreign policy. Now we're going to let you listen to the band for a moment. There he is, John, waving to the crowd. I see him. I have the camera focused. Yes, turn it on. Yes, John. 
Yes? Hey, what kind of camera is that? It's been me a blue light down on Farrington Farnsworth. Please, Frank, stand back. Cut power, Susie. Yes, John? What? Now the blue light is gone. So what are you two up to? You didn't take any picture of that. Hey, 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 something's happening down there. Yes, Frank. Farnsworth is slumping down in his seat. If something's happened. Mr. Farnsworth has just collapsed. The parade has stopped. The crowd seems stunned. Like he may have fainted. Now his physician is hurrying to his side. They're trying to rouse him. I'll uh, let you know as soon as I can find out just what's wrong. Good Lord. John, did you... Did, did that blue light have anything to do with Farnsworth's collapse just now? Yes, Frank. It caused his collapse. Now, close the window, Susie. Yes, John. Now the radio. Cut it off. We will not need it. But, John, what... Sorry, Frank. Hey, look here. What's going on? What are you two up to? We have just killed Farrington Farnsworth. You... Just kissed? Yes. Now, we haven't much time. Susie, better pack fast. Of course. We will talk while we pack, Frank. Farnsworth has had a heart attack. In a minute, he will be dead. That blue light caused the heart attack. It is a weapon very popular in 2228. The secret police use it a lot. Good Lord. It's a favorite weapon of Farrington Farnsworth the Eighth. It helped him keep the slaves quiet. Then you lied to me. Yes, we lied to you. We came back to your time in order to assassinate the first Farrington Farnsworth before he could ever become powerful. We came back to prevent the future from happening. We came back to remove one man to keep the world free. I, I, I don't get it. Think about it and you will. We are leaders of an underground dedicated to freeing the world of 2228. Our scientists perfected a time machine. We cannot fight the Farnsworth dictatorship in our own time, so we came back to eliminate it in advance. Well, then the future, all those things you told me, will never happen. We hope not. It is what we are trying to prevent. But, but Susie, you, you said you were a direct descendant of Farrington Farnsworth. Now, if he dies without any children, where will that leave you? I am afraid it will not leave me any place, Frank. I just will not ever have existed, that is all. And, John, John, darling. Yes, Susie. Hold me close. I feel so strange and, and far away. I think Farnsworth must be dying. I will hold you, Susie. Oh, Susie. Susie, if it could only have been different. John, I... I... John. Susie. She... She's gone. She vanished. She just... went out. Like a light going out. Yes. Like a light going out. Susie has never been born, Frank. Never existed. Farnsworth is dead. Dead. I, I understand, but, but... But to vanish like, like it that... It has to be. It is the price of freedom for the world. The whole future is different. I will go back to a world I may not even know. Now stand back, Frank. I am signaling for them to turn on the time transmitter and pull me back to 2228. Back in my own time, they hear that. They will be activating the apparatus. I'll be gone in a moment, Frank. But what will I tell people? Do what? not tell them anything. They may lock you up in a sanitarium if you do. Remember, the doctors will say Farnsworth died of a heart attack. There will be no proof he has been murdered. Now, goodbye, Frank. Are you... You're getting all misty, transparent. I can see through you. John! John! Goodbye, Frank. Goodbye. Be happy with Mabel. Remember, I predicted you would be famous. Forget about us. 
forget about us. He's gone. And the trunks. Everything they brought with them. Is gone. Everything is just gone. Well, that's the story, folks. It happened just this afternoon. John and Susie Dean from the year 2228 assassinated a man who would have become dictator. And I can't prove it. In fact... I wouldn't even have told you this, but Mabel, she felt we had to tell. Just before she went to the hospital, she made me a promise. The uh, the shock of what happened, well, it hurried things up, and we sent for the doctor right away after John vanished. We hurried her off. I'm I'm waiting now for word that everything's all right, and I decided I'd tell you the story while I waited. You see, here's... Oh, excuse me, the telephone. It may be the hospital. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, speaking. What's that? A boy? Oh, that's fine. How's my wife? Good, 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 good. Uh, tell her I'll, I'll be right over. What? You said it was a boy. Yeah, but, yeah, but I don't understand. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, no, it can't be. But they said everything's all right. And it's a boy, but... But not just one boy. Six. Six boys. But I... Oh, so that's what John meant. That's what he meant when he said... He could give me half a dozen reasons... Why we were going to be famous. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little visit from two people of the future? Oh, there are some questions you'd like to ask me? Well, I'd be glad to answer them just as soon as the program is over. Uh, We only have a minute left, you know. Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler. Now you can enjoy other exciting tales of The Mysterious Traveler in the current issue of The Mysterious Traveler magazine. In our cast were Lawson Zerby, Bryna Rayburn, Cliff Carpenter, and Miss Leslie Woods. Maurice Tarplin played the title role. Original music by Fred Mendelssohn. All characters in this story were fictional. Any resemblance to names of actual persons was purely coincidental. Phil Tonkin speaking. This program came to you from New York. The shadow knows. Yes, the shadow knows the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. And the ability of Lamont Cranston to become the invisible nemesis of evil strikes fear into the hearts of criminals across the world. The shadow's fight against the enemies of society is brought to you in eerie tales of suspense every Sunday. For adventure into the realm of the unknown, where an oriental secret transforms a man about town into an unseen presence, listen when Mutual presents the shadow every Sunday over most of these same stations. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.